Today on Call for Two, a spoiler-free review of the three new small box mystery suspect games from Hunt a Killer. Which of these games is worth seeking out and which should you avoid at all costs? Stay tuned to find out. Okay, we're back with another roundup of a set of mystery suspect games, this time from Hunt the Killer. Hunt the Killer is known for subscription boxes. So they're a company um, started in around 2016 and you sign up and every month, I believe every month or every week, whatever, you get a box that it's part of a continuing um, mystery that you're trying to solve. It's a small box, not nearly as big as these, maybe a quarter of the size, half the size of one of these. And the cases continue after, uh, for about six cases or so, six subscription boxes. And they have lots of them by now. And you can buy them as a full set now, but they're meant to be consumed piecewise till you get to the end, but they share much in common with this genre. Uh, but this is their foray into standalone small boxes. Now, if you're not familiar with this genre, what that I call the mystery suspect genre, um, I hope you'll go check out my, I have two, one video talking about the genre in general, and then um, in one of my first roundups, I talk more about the details of what what exactly is the genre but I hope you'll check that out first if you're not familiar consider subscribing to the channel if you like this stuff so just as a brief recap recap these are all games that are presented typically as a cold case an unsolved case where you open the box and you get this big document dump like a police file or just snippets from newspapers and um, interviews, transcripts, and props, and various things. You just dumped all that all at once. There's no time limit, there's no turns, there's no actions. You just go through the documents, you try to piece together the mystery. And they're all framed as, here's the five suspects it could be. They all have a motive, they all have some kind of alibi, and you're trying to find which is the real culprit, which person's alibi doesn't check out, which person had the best motive, etc. You find the one person you think did it, then you either go online to check your answer or you open an envelope, whatever, and you find out if you're right. No randomness, no, um, typically no destruction of components. It's not replayable because it's a story, um, but typically nothing gets destroyed so you could pass it on to someone else. So that's the genre, that's the history of Hunt a Killer. Now we're gonna find out if these are worth playing. All right, let's look at what we have here. We've got three boxes that are all the rated at the same playing time, which they rate at 45 to 60 minutes. I think typically you should take your time with these and maybe double that. Um, but they're rated at different difficulty levels. So Death at the Dive Bar is rated as easy, one out of five stars. Body on the Boardwalk is rated medium, two out of five, and Murder at the Motel is rated as medium, but three out of five. So easiest, middle, hardest of this set. Let's open up one of these boxes to take a look at the kinds of components you'll get, because that's a big part of these games is how immersive it feels to, to work with these documents. So I'm gonna open up Death at the Dive Bar, the easiest one. Let's just take a look at what you get. So you can see the documents are trying to be real. This is a, oh, I should say, this is um, totally spoiler free. Everything you're gonna look at here is, is stuff you would see the moment you open the box. So I really don't consider these spoilers. If you wanna look away, you can. It's not important, we're not gonna dwell on anything. So just a little coaster with some writing, a menu from a restaurant with some writing, a letter that's fairly common, photographs is common. Um, 
Here's the solution. So all the games have a solution envelope that you open when you think you know the answer and that will tell you the answer and whether you're right or wrong. Um, we've got what's fairly common. Each of the potential suspects here has got a photo, a little write-up of them. Um, here's the most interesting little document in this box, which is a, a kind of what you might expect the FBI to have uh, records on each, on different shoes, what, who they're for, and what kind of shoe prints they leave on the ground. Then we got some various props, some handbills, newspaper clipping, uh, pages, handwritten pages from a notebook, uh, printout from internet site, security camera, photo printout, another handbill. And then we've got these two introductory letters to the case, one from your uh, PI firm explaining why you're hired to work on this case, and then one letter from someone on the ground involved in the case who hired the PI. And we've got actually, this should be at the top here, but a nice instruction booklet that tells you what's in the box and just some introductory stuff. Um, that would be very suitable if you're completely new to this genre. I would say these Hunt a Killer games are aimed more for beginners to this genre. So a little uh, introductory talk on code breaking. Um, there's another little prop here, a matchbox. And then all of these Hunt a Killer box games and most of the subscription games as well have this component. They've got a, in this case, it's a bag locked with a combination code. The other two games here have uh, metal tins locked with a three digit combination code. And they've got documents or props and stuff, a few inside this. So the game is structured so that the first thing you have to do, one of the first things you have to do is figure out the code to unlock this. Then you unlock this, you'll get some more information which will advance the case. It's a, all three have it, it's a, it's a clever system. And there's a little advertisement thing. And then here in this game is a big, heavy bottle opener prop. Who knows how much this costs them to put in the box. Okay, they're all fairly uh, similar in contents. Um, they've got slightly different documents. They each have some, um, I would say they each have one document that's particularly kind of cool to get access to. Um, in uh, Body on the Boardwalk, it's a big unfoldable map. Um, maybe Murder at the Motel doesn't have one standout document, but it's got something that you can dig your teeth into. All right, so you saw the props, you get some idea of what it looks like inside. I would say in general, compared to other games of this genre, and it makes sense given the pedigree of Hunt a Killer. There's a little bit more of an emphasis on gimmicky props, like the metal tins with the combination lock, and you saw that big heavy bottle opener. For, for me, that's not, uh, that's not where I'd I want my money to go. I'd rather have more paper documents to read. So I was very suspicious of these Hunt a Killer boxes coming in. If you see the subscription boxes, you'll see that like they come with hats and stuff that were found at the scene, you know, things that aren't, that aren't worth, you won't spend time studying to try to understand how they relate to the case. There might be a little bit of a relation to the case, but it's just more of a gimmicky prop. And I would say Hunt a Killer leans a little bit more on that, but I was very suspicious that that was gonna be all that there was in these games. And I guess, let's talk a little bit about, let's give you the punchline a little bit and then dig into a little bit about what makes these games work when they work and uh, not work. Um, so I would say the easiest one of these, Death at the Dive Bar, um, I would, which is the, labeled as easy, I would absolutely not recommend. Avoid it, don't buy it. There is no group that this is good for. It's not just that it's 
it's not too easy. That's not the problem with this game. I mean, as someone who's got some experience with these games, I'm going to shy away from enjoying. I'm not going to want to play the easy ones. They might be too easy, but I could recommend those for someone new to the genre. The problem with this one is not that it's too easy. It's that it's very shallow. It's completely... Um, the, there are boring characters. It's, there's very little motivation to want to solve anything. The work here is busy work. There's a very... All of these games involve some cipher crypto thing where you're trying to figure out how to decipher a code. They're all different. They all try something different. This has got the most unsatisfying, the most busy work. Um, it's got the silliest props. Uh, so as far as mystery and story and emotional involvement and arc and all of that stuff, it's the worst of all of them, uh, the least engaging and not, not recommended to so just completely avoid that. No subtlety, no humor, etc. And I'll start by saying that all of them have a system for getting checking your answer and all of them have a website system and I want to take a special minute to talk about how bad that is. Of all of the dozens of these mystery suspect games I've played, the Hunted Killer boxes have the worst maybe with a slight exception to some of the murder mystery party games, but have an absolutely horrendous system for checking your answer and getting a fuller, richer, fleshed out story explanation. So typically with these games, since they're going to have you go on the internet, now, and that's a little debatable whether they really needed you to go on the internet, um, but this game doesn't need you to go on the internet to check your answer. So once you think you're ready, you open this envelope and it basically says, yeah, you're right, Mr. X did it. You arrested him, he went to jail, good work. It's not an explanation of the mystery. It doesn't explain to you all the, th the things that, you've, that could have been figured out. It doesn't ask you to answer a question. The moment you open and look at that envelope, it tells you the answer and it says, congratulations, you figured it out whether you figured it out or not, and you could be wrong. Then you can go on the website, and the first thing that happens when you go on the website is it wants to force you to put in your email address before it will give you access to the hints or the solution. You can put in a fake web uh, email address if you know that, then you'll get access to the hints. The hints aren't terrible, there are a series of hints that gradually give you information about different props, um, etc. They're not the best in class. The adventure um, group of ones are, have set the standard for that, but it's not bad. And I would suggest, unless you are absolutely dead sure of the answer, maybe instead of opening that envelope, go to the website and start going through the hints to make sure you understand it. It would just give you a second chance at getting it right if you get to a hint and you realize, oh, we missed that, then you could go back. The website will give you uh, a solution. You can also click and read the solution. It's a little more richer of a solution, but pretty sparse. It won't talk about lots of things that you encountered. There are going to be things that you encountered maybe you didn't understand, or maybe you wanted something to explain why this was a false lead, why this was not the proof that you thought it might be. Most of that is missing on the website. And then the website has a little epilogue letter that you can read that's sort of like after the case was solved, a letter from the person who called you in to let you know an update. It's kind of a fun story idea. Some of the other mystery suspect games have done that. This one for Hunt a Killer, you absolutely cannot get unless you give it an email address because you have to give it an email address which signs you up to their newsletter so that they can try to sell you their other stuff. And then it emails you a photograph of a piece of paper that could have been in the box uh, uh, in that final solution envelope, but isn't just so that forces you to go on the internet, forces you to sign up to their newsletter, and then forces you to get emailed uh, 
an image of the letter to give you this little extra bonus story. So it's absolutely the worst in the genre implementation of the final solution. A lot of the other ones are much better about going on a website. The very best ones in this genre, you go on a website and it says something like who did it? What's the evidence that proves they did it? And then maybe some bonus questions like what was the significance of this? So that you hit that website when you think you understand it and hopefully you get it right. You put in your answers. You hope you got it right. If you're wrong, it says, no, you're wrong. Go back and figure out what you missed. This one is just open the envelope, instantly find out if you're right or wrong and you're never going to get too satisfied. So completely indefensible. Um, the one, the one pro for all of these, the one nice part to all of these is that the best games in this genre have a little bit of staging of information. So as I said, in general, you open up the box, you get all the documents, but the idea that there's this locked container that has some more documents that advance the case and it's, so it's staggered. It's going to take you a while to get to that act two where you open the box. All of the games use that. Sometimes it feels a little forced and fake that there would be something with this code. You know, it's not super, super believable, but it is a way to stage information. And that two stage, two act system does work and it is satisfying. Okay, so I said avoid death at the dive bar. No reason to play it. Um, Body on the Boardwalk is sort of in the middle here. It's semi recommended by me. It's not great. The characters are pretty boring. The mystery is pretty shallow. It's got all the same problems with the solution envelope. Again, not very subtle, no humor, very straightforward, but it has some interesting props. The cipher code breaking stuff is not nearly as painful and pointless as it is at death at the dive bar. It's busy work, but it might be kind of enjoyable and fun. The story is not terrible. There are some pieces that some clues that fit together when you get to the end. So, I mean, it's okay. It's reasonable and it's fairly easy. I would agree. It's not going to be satisfying to someone who's uh, real experienced in this genre, but it's not a, it's not a bad game to start with a little disappointing, but not bad. And then lastly, we have murder at the motel. This was actually the first one I played, but this is the one that sort of surprised me because while it's got the same weakness for the end solution stuff, it actually has much better writing than the other two. There's some subtlety, there's some humor, the pacing and the arc is good. You'll sort of be led on some false trails and then realize they're not, they're not, they're not, you can't use them the way you thought you could. There are some detailed documents that you have to study that what you want in a genre like this is you don't want to be hunting completely for needles in a haystack for no reason. You don't want to have to do a huge amount of work for no payoff. And you want to be rewarded for sort of digging in and understanding a document. And ideally you'd like a document to challenge you to really require you to say, okay, let's really understand what this means. Let's really understand the significance. And I would say murder at the motel has some of that. The solution is better. The explanation of some details is better. It's not perfect, but there are some subtleties when you play these games. What you'd like is when there's probably going to be things you don't quite understand, things that you understand well enough. Hopefully you've got enough evidence to, to point you to the right person, but you want those aha moments. You want some twists. You want that stage two where you understand it a little better. And then like a good movie, when you get to the end and understand it, you want to be able to look back and make sense of some things that you didn't quite make sense of until you figured out like, oh, that's why this happened. That's why this happened. And uh, Murder at the Motel has that. 
it has some elements where you're like, oh, that was clever. That explains this weird thing that I didn't quite understand. So there you have it. Three games, three small box mystery suspect games from Hunt to Killer. One to avoid at all costs. One that would be okay. And one that's worth hunting down at Target and playing. And I would say... This is not a bad game to start the genre, especially if you're sort of like a family and not ready for super hardcore stuff. Like if you wanted to try your first game of these mystery suspect games, this would not be a bad place to start, especially for sort of a group where unlocking that box is fun. I'm not sure that I would, that it would be my first choice for a first game. Maybe the Harmony Ashcroft game that's on Amazon for like 20 bucks, that would probably be a better better bang for your buck, better starting point. But this isn't too far off and uh, it's not bad at all. If you like this, please consider subscribing to the channel. And um, if you're more experienced in this genre, stay tuned for an upcoming video where I look at the four games in the adventure series of Mystery Suspects, which are a whole different tier of games in terms of difficulty, length, and sophistication. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye.